when he was at his best, he was a stat sheet stuffer. He could score, rebound very well for a guard, was always good for a few assists, and could disrupt the other team with his pesky defense. During the early stages of Larry Hughes' career, he used his exceptional athleticism and his deceptive handle to help him penetrate and score and play above the rim. And on defense, he was adept at jumping passing lanes. But after some great stretches in Golden State and Washington, he went to Cleveland and didn't do at all what he was expected to, as he quickly fell out of favor with coaches and fans due to his poor shot selection, which would even lead to one fan creating a website pleading with him to stop taking bad shots. And it's true that shooting below 41% for your career is not good, but Larry Hughes shouldn't be judged on that flaw alone, as throughout his career, he could still give you 10 to 15 points, along with a few rebounds and a few assists, while playing good defense, even once leading the league in steals. Injuries and tragedy would also overshadow his short time in Cleveland, which was his best opportunity to win, as after being traded away from there, he could never find a stable situation again. But Larry Hughes would still give you production, even if his shots weren't falling, all while often playing at less than 100%, and that's the kind of player you can't help but have respect for. Let's jog your memory. A St. Louis native, Larry Hughes attended Christian Brothers College High School, where he established himself as one of the greatest basketball players in St. Louis history. As a senior in 1997, he led the team to the Missouri State Championship which included him scoring 40 points against Riverview in a playoff game, as he would also earn a second team Parade All-American selection and a spot in the 97 McDonald's All-American game, where he had 17 points and nine rebounds. Hughes had all the best programs in college basketball hoping for his commitment, but he would instead choose to stay at home and play for St. Louis University. And this decision was mostly influenced by being able to stay close to his little brother, Justin, who had a heart defect and had almost lost his life recently. So Larry Hughes was a Billiken going into the 98 season. St. Louis was a few years removed from their last tournament appearance, and in 97 they had possessed one of the worst offenses in the nation, yet one of its best defenses. So Hughes was a great addition due to his two-way ability. They would maintain their top 25 scoring defense, but on offense they would put up nearly 10 more points per game, which was mainly because of Hughes. They had lost their top scorer from 97 in Jeff Harris to graduation, yet he had averaged below 13 points per game. So in 98, Hughes became their top scorer and the only player on the team to average double figures, as his nearly 21 points per game was second in the conference. And he would also pull down over 5 rebounds per game and finish tied for second on the team in assists. And his defense was still on full display, as his 2.2 steals per game would lead the team and be second in the conference, as Hughes would be voted first team all-conference USA. One of the only knocks on Hughes' freshman season was his efficiency and shot selection, but every opponent knew to key in on him, so it wasn't easy to get clean looks. St. Louis would start the year 8-0 and rank as high as number 13, but after losing 5 straight, they would fall out of the national rankings. So after 13 games, they were 8-5 and, and would go 12-4 and the rest of the way to finish at 20-9. They would defeat Tulane in the first round of the Conference USA Tournament before losing to UAB in the quarterfinals but they would still get a bid to the NCAA tournament as a 10 seed. Round one brought UMass, who St. Louis would be able to defeat by five points as the freshman Hughes finished with a game high 18 points and two steals. He would only go six of 17 from the field, but four of those buckets came in the last five minutes when Hughes scored the Billikens final nine points to close out the game. The second round brought Kentucky, but St. Louis fell behind nearly 30 points at halftime and weren't able to come back as Hughes finished with 11 points five rebounds and three steals, yet shot below 24% in a loss, as his freshman year ended with him averaging about 21 points, five rebounds, and two steals per game. So Hughes had an exceptional freshman season, yet could have stayed in school to further polish his game, but instead he would declare for the 1998 NBA draft, as he would say this was in part due to feeling he was ready for the next step, and in part to alleviate the financial strain put on his mother from his brother's medical bills. And on draft night, a 19-year-old Hughes wouldn't be waiting long to hear his name called. With the eighth pick in the 1998 NBA draft, the Philadelphia 76ers select Larry Hughes from St. Louis University. So Hughes was drafted eighth overall by the Sixers, but he tends to be more remembered for the two players he was drafted ahead of, as the ninth pick saw Dirk Nowitzki get drafted, with the tenth pick being Paul Pierce. And Sixers head coach Larry Brown would say years later that Paul Pierce was the number two prospect on their draft board, but they clearly didn't think he would fall to them. And during a pre-draft interview, Brown had reportedly promised Hughes they would draft him if he was there at number eight. So Brown stuck to his promise and took the combo guard. The Sixers featured a budding superstar in Allen Iverson, 
and had just traded away another good shooting guard last year in Jerry Stackhouse. Hughes wasn't the score that Stackhouse was, but he could do a lot more, as he could play both guard positions, run the offense, and play great defense. And even though Larry Brown had a reputation for not giving rookies much playing time, Hughes would play every game and get nearly 20 minutes per game. Iverson and Hughes were looked at as a good young athletic duo, even earning the brief nickname of the Flight Brothers for their alley-oop connections. Individually, Hughes would hit double figures in 25 games, including two games with at least 20, while also recording a 12-point, 10-rebound double-double in an April 7th win over New Jersey. But he would shoot only about 41% from the field, which ended up being a problem that plagued his entire career. The Sixers had spent the majority of the 90s as one of the league's worst teams, but they would finish the lockout-shortened season with their first winning record in eight years, at 28-22, and 22, which would earn them a first-round matchup versus Orlando. Hughes would have a great playoff debut, as he came off the bench to average over 12 points, 6 rebounds, and 2 steals per game on 45% shooting. He would hit double figures in each game, as the Sixers were able to advance in 4, setting up a second round matchup with Indiana. But this series would be over quick, as although most of the games were close, Indiana would sweep Philly. Hughes continued coming off the bench to put up 10 points in Game 1, then would be a starter for Games 2 and 3, where he would average about 9.5 points and 3 steals per game. But he would again come off the bench in Game 4, and would put up just 3 points on 1 of 7 shooting. But his rookie season would end with him averaging about 9 points, 4 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game. Hughes had a similar role for the Sixers in Year 2, as he continued coming off the bench and getting about 20 minutes per game. His efficiency was roughly the same, which continued to be the big issue. Yet you couldn't say he wasn't exciting, as his leaping ability would even get him a spot in the 2000 slam dunk contest. But soon afterwards, the Hughes and Iverson experiment was over. Just a few days after the dunk contest, with Hughes playing one more game for Philly post All-Star break, he was part of a three-team deal, which saw him sent to Golden State, as it made sense for Philly. Hughes, like Iverson, wasn't too efficient and had an inconsistent outside shot, as well as a gambling attitude on defense. And having two players like that was unnecessary. So Hughes would go west to join a young Warriors team who were 13-37 and 37 at the time of the trade. Hughes would now be a starter for the remainder of the season and didn't really come off the court, playing nearly 41 minutes per game in his 32 games with the Warriors. His shooting dropped to below 39% as he was averaging over 21 shots per game. But he would fill the stat sheet in his time with Golden State, averaging nearly 23 points, 6 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 steals per game. As he had 2 games with at least 40 points, including his career high of 44 points in an April 9th defeat of Denver, while also recording 4 double-doubles with Golden State and 5 in total. But the Warriors were bad, going just 6-26 and 26 after acquiring Hughes and finishing at 19-63. and 63. But for his overall season, Hughes would average about 15 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 1.5 steals per game. Hughes would get a full season in Golden State in 2001. The Warriors looked to be building something, as one of the reasons why Hughes took so many shots after the trade last year was because Golden State was without their best player in Antoine Jameson, who they had lost for the season due to a knee injury prior to the Hughes trade. But now he was back healthy and looked to form a good duo with Hughes. Yet although Jameson would play all 82 games, it was Hughes who was limited by injury, as ligament damage in his thumb would lead to him missing 10 games mid-season. Then he would miss the final 22 games of the season due to thumb and shoulder issues. When he did play, he was solid, finishing as the team's second leading scorer behind Jamison, while also forming a tough defensive backcourt alongside veteran Mookie Blaylock. Hughes would hit double figures in 47 games, including 11 games with at least 20, and 6 double-doubles. But Golden State remained one of the league's worst teams, as they were 13-37 with Hughes, and 4-28 and without him, finishing at 17-65 and, and missing the playoffs, as Hughes would average about 16.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game. The 0-2 Warriors continued to add pieces, as they drafted great, bringing in Jason Richardson, Troy Murphy, and Gilbert Arenas. Hughes would appear in 73 games, starting 56 of them, but his role had greatly diminished, as after getting nearly 37 minutes per game in 2001, he would barely get 28 minutes in 2002 as Richardson was quickly establishing himself as the team's second option. Hughes' scoring had dropped by over 4 points per game, yet he would still finish as a top 3 scorer on the team. However, he was taking significantly less shots per game, but was shooting a then-career-high 42.3% from the field, as he would hit double figures in 50 games, including 9 games with at least 20 and 5 double-doubles. With this season seeing Hughes even lead the team in assists per game, while defensively he would tie for the team lead with 1.5 steals per game. The Warriors would move on from head coach Dave Cowens after 23 games 
and replace him with Brian Winters, marking the third coach of Hughes' brief time with the Warriors. But they wouldn't fare much better under Winters as they possessed the league's worst scoring defense and would finish the season at 21-61 and, and again miss the playoffs. As Hughes' season ended with him averaging about 12.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game. But Hughes' contract was up, and he would decide to test free agency after the season. Hughes would sign a three-year deal with Washington prior to the 03 season. This was a good pickup for Washington, but Michael Jordan's comeback in 02 and his upcoming farewell season overshadowed any other moves they made. However, Hughes was in an interesting situation. The Wizards knew he was a starting caliber player, but their wing positions were set with Jordan and the newly acquired Jerry Stackhouse, so they would opt to have Hughes run the point this season, and it resulted in the most efficient year of his career. With the high volume scoring duo of Jordan and Stackhouse, Hughes didn't have to do much of the scoring. However, he would still finish as the only other player on the team to average double figures. And even though he was running the point, he would finish tied for fourth on the team in assists per game. But this was also due to the ISO and post play that Stackhouse and Jordan would rely on to get their points. But with these two commanding a lot of the defensive attention, it allowed Hughes to let the offense come to him. And it resulted in him shooting a career high 46.7% from the field and nearly 37% from deep, while committing just two turnovers per game. Hughes would hit double figures in 48 games and record six double doubles. But the Wizards lacked depth, as most of their scoring came from their trio, resulting in a bottom five scoring offense and a 37 and 45 record, which wouldn't be enough for the playoffs, as Hughes ended his first season in Washington, averaging about 13 points, four and a half rebounds, and three assists per game. It was a new look Wizards team going into 04. Jordan had retired, and the Wizards had signed their second straight Golden State free agent in Hughes's former Warriors teammate, Gilbert Arenas while also featuring a new coach in Eddie Jordan. Although the Wizards still featured Stackhouse, injuries would limit him to just 26 games this year, so a backcourt of Hughes and Arenas would combine to average over 38 points per game. Yet they would also each miss over 20 games this season, as Hughes would deal with a fractured wrist. With more offensive responsibility, Hughes would again make more questionable shooting decisions, as his overall shooting dropped below 40%, yet his three-point shooting remained at a respectable 34.1%. Hughes would hit double figures in 56 games while recording 6 games with at least 30 and a 43 point game in a January 10th win over Philadelphia. And he would also record 3 double doubles. But injuries ruined what once looked like a potentially promising season, as Washington would go just 25 and 57, again missing the playoffs, as Hughes finished the year averaging about 19 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game. But Hughes would really show his two way ability by putting together his best career season in 2005. It was a full Golden State reunion going into 05, as an offseason trade had seen Stackhouse shipped to Dallas for the reigning sixth man of the year and former warrior Antoine Jameson. And a Jameson, Arenas, and Hughes trio would be one of the best in the league. The three would combine to average over 67 points per game, as Hughes finished second on the team in scoring behind a career high 22 points per game, while also pulling down a career high 6.3 rebounds and dishing a career high 4.7 assists per game while shooting a more respectable 43% from the field. And this wasn't just a career year offensively for Hughes, as this would be the only season of his career in which he averaged at least two steals, with his career high 2.9 steals per game acting as the highest average in the league, which would earn him a first team all defense selection and would even see him finish sixth in defensive player of the year voting. Hughes would again manage just 61 games, in most part due to a broken thumb he suffered in January. But in the games he did play, he hit double figures in 58 of them including 41 games with at least 20 points. He also had 7 double-doubles and his first career triple-double, when he had 33 points, 10 rebounds, and 10 assists in a November 28th win over Toronto. And on the defensive end, he would record 33 games with at least 3 steals. Overall, the Wizards didn't have a great defense, but their trio led to them finishing as the 6th best scoring offense in the league, which in turn led to a 45-37 record and a playoff berth, where Hughes would be a difference maker in a first round series versus Chicago. For the series, Hughes would average 22.5 points, nearly 7 rebounds, 4 assists, and over 2 steals per game. But he would only shoot about 40% from the field and go 4 of 21 from deep. He would go for a game-high 31 points in a Game 1 loss, then put up 19 points, 10 rebounds, and 5 steals in a Game 2 loss. He would have 21 points in a Game 3 win, then even after having just 10 points on 3 of 16 shooting in Game 4, the Wizards were able to even the series. Hughes would then go on to drop a postseason career high 33 points to go along with 9 rebounds, 7 assists, and 3 steals in a Game 5 win before the Wizards closed out the series in Game 6, with Hughes dropping 21 points. Round 2 brought Miami, 
who were too much for Washington as the Wizards were swept. Hughes would still average about 18 points, 7.5 rebounds, and 2 steals per game, but he shot below 33% from the field and went 3 of 12 from beyond the arc, while also having his hands full with Dwayne Wade, who averaged 31 points on nearly 54% shooting. But Hughes' career year would end with him averaging about 22 points, 6.5 rebounds, 4.5 assists, and 3 steals per game. But Hughes was a free agent again, and it was time for another change. Hughes would sign with Cleveland in the offseason, however he was more of a consolation for the Cavs, as they had initially wanted to sign Michael Red, but didn't have the cap space to match the Bucks' offer, so they would instead sign Hughes to a 5-year $70 million deal. Yet 06 wouldn't go as planned for Hughes. The Cavs were led by their young superstar in LeBron James, and were trying to get him the help he needed, as they didn't have much outside of veteran big man Zydrunas Ilgauskas. Hughes would join his former Sixers teammate in the backcourt in Eric Snow, as the two formed a solid defensive duo. Hughes would have a good start to the season, as after 28 games, the Cavs were 18-10, with Hughes averaging 16.2 points, 4.2 rebounds, 3.9 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. However, he was doing so on below 42% shooting, but he would then suffer a broken finger in early January, which would keep him out for over 3 months, as he would only return to play in 8 of the team's final 9 games. But when you have LeBron James, you're going to be good, as the Cavs would still finish at 50-32 and 32 and get a first round matchup with Hughes' former team in the Washington Wizards. However, Hughes was playing with a lot on his mind, as his brother Justin was not in good health, yet he would still play every game of this series. He would have just 2 points on 1 of 9 shooting while playing less than 27 minutes due to foul trouble in a Game 1 win, then would come back with an improved 16 points and 4 steals, albeit on about 31% shooting in a Game 2 loss. He would have another 16.4 steal performance in a Game 3 win, before going for just 7 points and fouling out in a Game 4 loss. Game 5 would be his best, as he had 24 points on over 42% shooting in nearly 48 minutes of action in a 1 point overtime win. And even though he had just 3 assists, he would be the one to assist on James's game winner. Then Game 6 would see him put up just 9 points on 3 of 17 shooting, but he would have 4 steals and also dish a postseason career high 12 assists which included his second straight game of assisting on the game winner, as he would be the one to pass the ball to Damon Jones in the corner for the game and series winner. The second round brought the Detroit Pistons, and after averaging just 8 points on less than 31% shooting over the first two games, while fouling out of game 2, and the Cavs falling behind 0-2, Hughes got the tragic news that his brother had passed away just one day before game 3, at the age of 20. So for this reason, Hughes wouldn't play in the team's next four games, as the Cavs were actually able to win three straight before losing the fourth, as the series would enter the deciding game seven, and Hughes would return. However, he would have just 10 points on two of six shooting off the bench in a blowout loss, ending Cleveland's year. But for the regular season, Hughes averaged about 15 and a half points, four and a half rebounds, and three and a half assists per game. So although Hughes would never be able to recapture his 05 form, the 07 season would be a breakthrough year for the Cavs. Hughes would play a much healthier year in 2007 as he would appear in 70 games and finish second on the team in scoring and steals behind James as a mostly full season of Hughes would help the Cavs feature a top 5 scoring defense. Hughes would hit double figures in 55 games, have 15 games with at least 20, and one double-double as the Cavs would put together a very similar season to last year, finishing with an identical 50-32 and 32 record. However, Hughes began dealing with plantar fasciitis near the end of the season but at least for the beginning of the postseason, it didn't seem to have any effect on his game, with the Cavs getting the Wizards in round one for the second straight year. This series would be easier for Cleveland as they swept Washington, with Hughes averaging about 19 points and 7 rebounds on over 44% shooting, as he hit double figures in every game and would even have a game-high 27 in the Cavs' game one win. Round two brought New Jersey, and it seemed that Hughes' heel may have been bothering him more this series, as his scoring dropped below 14 points per game on about 32% shooting. However, he would also average 2 steals per game and shoot 37% from deep. He started well hitting double figures in each of the first 4 games, including a 23 point game 2. But after scoring 19 points in a game 4 win to put the Cavs up 3, over games 5 and 6 he would average just 6 points, on a combined 4 of 23 shooting, as Cleveland would drop game 5 before taking game 6 to advance to the conference finals versus Detroit. Hughes would put up 13 points and 7 rebounds in a close game 1 loss, in what would be his final game of the postseason scoring in double figures, as the rest of the series would see Hughes average 6 points and about 2 assists on less than 36% shooting. But this was more so due to Hughes tearing his plantar fascia in Game 3, so even though he wasn't contributing a lot, 
It spoke to his toughness that he continued to play through it, as the Cavs were able to win the series in six to advance to their first finals appearance in franchise history. The Cavs would meet the Spurs, but on top of Hughes being a non-factor on the offensive end, his heel was also preventing him from being an effective defender on both Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili. As after two games, Hughes had scored a combined two points, Parker was averaging over 28 points, and the Cavs were down 0-2. So before game three, it was announced that Hughes would be shut down due to his heel, but the Cavs would still lose their next two as they were swept by San Antonio. But for the regular season, Hughes averaged about 15 points, four rebounds, and three and a half assists per game. All things considered, it was a successful season for Cleveland in 07. So it was a letdown in 2008, when shortly after the All-Star break, they were just six games above 500 at 30 and 24. An injury to Eric Snow had led to Hughes playing point guard for the team, but his numbers had still dropped for the fourth straight year, and he was shooting below 38% while playing just 40 of the team's first 54 games. But then on February 21st, Hughes was included in a three-team deal which saw him end up as a new member of the Chicago Bulls. Hughes would return to shooting guard in Chicago, joining Kirk Heinrich in the backcourt. The Bulls featured a lot of solid youth in guys like Heinrich, Ben Gordon, and Luol Deng, as the now 29-year-old Hughes was more of a veteran on the team. The Bulls were 21-32 at the time of the trade, and after Hughes' arrival he wouldn't see much change in his production, as they would go 12-17 with him, yet a 33-49 record wouldn't be enough for the playoffs, as his overall season ended with him averaging about 12 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. Hughes would begin the 0-9 season in an unfamiliar role, as he was coming off the bench for the first time since his stint in Philadelphia, as the Bulls had added more backcourt talent in first overall pick Derrick Rose. Hughes would miss the first few games of the season with a dislocated shoulder before appearing in the next 30 games, putting up about 12 points per game and shooting nearly 39% from deep. But he would fall out of the rotation in mid-January, as up to that point, Kirk Heinrich had been out with injury. Yet Hughes had been made aware that when Heinrich came back, he would not play, as after logging 10 straight DNPs, then being inactive, he would make it clear that he wanted to trade, and eventually he would get another change of scenery less than a year after he had been traded to Chicago, as on February 19th, the Bulls shipped him to New York. Hughes would get more playing time in New York, but he wasn't entering a winning situation, as they were 22-31 and 31 at the time of the trade, but he would play in 25 games for the Knicks while starting 14 of them, and continuing his solid 3-point shooting, as his overall 38.9% mark from deep this season would be a career high. Yet the Knicks would go just 10 of 19 after the Hughes trade to finish at 32 and 50 and miss the playoffs. As Hughes' season ended with him averaging about 11 and a half points, three rebounds, and two assists per game. Hughes began the 2010 season with the Knicks, and while he was in a similar role, for the first time since he was a rookie, he would average less than 10 points per game and was really struggling with his shot making. But after appearing in 27 of New York's first 32 games, he would see the floor just four more times in their next 21 games as he was suffering from a fractured finger. But then he was traded to Sacramento on February 18th, yet he would never suit up for the Kings as he was waived just five days later. Then in mid-March, he would sign with Charlotte, reuniting Hughes with his former coach in Philly. Charlotte had traded their leading bench scorer in Flip Murray earlier in the year and were hoping for some two-way production from Hughes, as they were sitting at 33-31 and 31 at the time of the trade and had a legitimate chance to make their first playoff appearance in franchise history. And Hughes would give Charlotte solid averages of about eight points, two rebounds, and two assists, but he was shooting below 33% from the field in the 14 games he appeared in, as the Bobcats would ultimately finish at 44-38 and 38 and make their first playoff appearance in a matchup with Orlando. This would end in defeat for Charlotte as Orlando swept them. Hughes would appear in all four games coming off the bench, and even though he would only put up six points per game, he did it on a pretty efficient 47.1% shooting, while adding about three rebounds and three assists per game. But for the overall regular season, Hughes averaged about 9 points, 3 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Hughes would not re-sign with the Bobcats after the year, and would remain unsigned for the entire 2011 season. But then prior to the beginning of the lockout-shortened 2012 season, Hughes would sign with the Orlando Magic. He would play sparingly over the first two months of the year, but had given the Magic some valuable minutes as they dealt with injuries to Jameer Nelson and Jason Richardson. But then after scoring two points in a February 1st win over Washington, Orlando would release Hughes, marking his final time on an NBA court. As in his nine games, he would average about one and a half points, half a rebound, and an assist per game. Larry Hughes was a good all-around player. It's easy to see him as more of a bust or maybe a draft reach, seeing as how he was drafted right before two all-time greats. But when you're taken that high, you're expected to average more than 14 points for your career. 
And while you can't get around the fact that Larry Hughes had some poor shot selection, his value needs to be recognized for everything he did outside of scoring. He was one of the best guard rebounders during his playing days, and he could run your offense and pass effectively. And although he was more of a gambler on defense, he was still an above average defender and put up some great steal numbers. Additionally, injuries made it difficult for him to reach his full potential, as it seemed like he was rarely playing at 100%. He looked to be on his way after some great years in Golden State and Washington. But after that, he had the unfortunate reality of being a consolation signing in Cleveland, then dealing with the loss of his brother and a lot of injuries for the rest of his career. Larry Hughes may not have lived up to the billing that some people placed on him, but he was far from a scrub and doesn't get enough recognition for being the smooth and versatile player he was on the court. But that's it for today's episode on Larry Hughes. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his teammates during his early years, or this one on one of the players he was traded for. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.